Kristen Atchison here, and we're talking about multimodal perception. This is our first it lecture on the topic, so we're just going to kind of go over the basics. Um, this chapter is being presented by the NOVA Project on Multimodal Perception, and that is a free textbook um, that's, a, that's available online. So, unified perception um, is what we're talking about in this chapter. First, let's go over some definitions. Um, these are all the different sensations that we've talked about this semester. We've talked about vision, we talked about audition, olfaction, gestation, and the body senses. Each of, each of these is a sensory modality. Um, each of them is its own modality. Um, so vision is one modality, audition is another, gestation, and we have talked about how these things kind of work together. We've talked about your textbook um, because it doesn't have a chapter um, dedicated to cross-modal or multimodal perception. Um, kind of talks about that throughout the course, um, but we're going to really focus on this here. Um, so unimodal um, stimuli are stimuli that are presented with only one sensory modality. So if you're getting information, um, you're just hearing something. So um, if you've got headphones on and the only way that information is being presented to you is through your ears, that is unimodal presentation. You're having a unimodal um, sensation. Multimodal um, means that we have more than one sensory modality being used here. Um, we also talk about sometimes bimodal, which will be two modalities, um, but even bimodal presentation is still going to be multimodal. We have more than one sensory modality. So that can be, and that can be any combination of these. So it can be audio and visual, so AV, right? Um, that's talking about multimodal stimulation. Um, olfaction and gustation, so when we talk about flavor, that's going to be multimodal um, uh, stimulation. And it can be more than these. So we can have information that's presented over three modalities. Um, audio, visual, and, and one of the body senses. Um, so again, this can be any kind of combination of each of the sensory modalities into this kind of integrated um, unit, right? It's being presented all as one. Amodal information um, is information that's not specific to an uh, individual modality. Um, so you can convey different information um, across different sensory modalities. If you can lip read, you can either get that information auditorily through, through unimodally through audition, you can get it unimodally through vision if you can lip read, um, or you can get it multimodal um, through audition and vision. Um, that means that that speech is amodal information for you. Um, we'll talk about other things such as tempo, um, things like that, rhythm. These are things that can be presented across many different modalities. Um, so again, it's not specific to one modality. It's not something that can only be conveyed in one particular way. Um, so even music, right? Um, so even for people who are deaf, um, they, you know, have music sensation, but they do it through the body senses. Um, through those, that displacement of sound creates vibrations. Um, and that um, is a way to, to get that information. Um, so amodal information is just something that doesn't, it's not information that has a specific modality that it has to be conveyed in. There could be a traditional modality for that, one that may be easier to get that information out of, one that we think about that one for, uh, but again, it, it's not specific. So we have this system, we have all these different senses, um, and again, they're more than just the five that are listed here because that body senses is really broken up into many different um, senses as we talked about um, in chapter 12. But what we see is that when we are presented with stimuli in our world, we don't think of them as unimodal, right? We don't think of them as only coming from one of these sensory situations. We see them as a unified perception, that all of these things are integrated together. We have sensory integration. So let me show you a little video clip um, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so there was a lot of stuff going on there.
there. We were getting information from multiple sensory modalities. We were getting information visually. We were getting information auditorily. If your speakers are really turned up loud, you may have been getting information um, through some of the body senses as well. Um, we were getting different information here about this, inf about this ball bouncing. Now the question is, do you perceive the ball sound and the ball bouncing and the visual, do you perceive those as separate? No, you don't, right? You just see a ball bouncing and you don't think about the fact that you're getting information from two different sources. You have this perception of this unified um, whole, right? We have a whole object. Um, and we talked about this, you know, some throughout different things. How do how does the system put these things back together? That's what we're talking about primarily in this multimodal chapter is this idea that we have this integration. And how does it do it? And why does it do it? And are there benefits to that? And there are benefits to that. Um, we all have heard the saying, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This really applies very much to multimodal perception. Um, the perception of that integrated whole of the basketball um, is actually better than just the auditory and the visual alone, even um, if you were to add those together. So we see that responses are greater with multimodal stimulation than we see with unimodal stimulation. So even if you were to take the response, and this can be either neurally or it can be behaviorally, um, for the audio, um, the audition of the sound of the bouncing ball, and the video of the bouncing ball. And you were to take kind of what those behavioral responses were or those neural responses and look at the kind of quantify them, come up with a number, say each one of them is five. And this is again, just to kind of give you an idea what this means. So each one of them is worth five. Well, when we put them together, this multimodal experience isn't worth 10, it's worth 15. And again, that's just to kind of give you this idea that even when you add together the responses of unimodal information, even if you were to look at these things unimodally and add them together, the fact that we have this integrated representation is better. We get richer information, we get better information, um, and we get better responses because of that. Now, because this is psychology and because this is a science class, um, there's a super fancy term for that. It's called the super additive effect of multisensory integration. And it just means that when we integrate that information from different sensory modalities, we get a bigger effect. We get this super additive effect. Something else is added to it outside of just each sensory modality. We've got more there. It's richer information because it's being presented as this integrated whole. And we'll see that this is really, really beneficial for us in a couple of different ways. Um, and we'll talk about a theory that really focuses on infancy, but it's really apl applicable all throughout the lifespan. This is also called multisensory enhancement. The idea that when we're having these multisensory experiences, and we have them all the time, um, and the majority of our experiences are multisensory um, experiences, you listening to this lecture right now is a multisensory experience because you can see it and you can hear it. Um, when you have this integration of this, we have that enhancement. Again, that's that idea where we have more is being added than just each individual modality of information. But the problem with this idea is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts is that we're still talking about this all or none system, right? We talked about that at the very, very beginning of the course and that neurons operate on this all or none system. Um, and, and so thus we operate on this all or none system. So we also will talk about kind of a component of that is if you have really small responses um, from these unimodal components, okay? So each piece is a relatively small response. When you add it together, you have a big room for enhancement, okay? You have a, a lot of room to kind of get this extra richer information through this integration, okay? You've got a lot of benefits, a lot of room for additional benefits there. However, um, if you already have a large response from a unimodal stimulation, so if you already have a big response from this hearing information, this audition information, there's not as much room for enhancement, right? Because we already have this big response. 
response. There's not as much room to grow. Um, so when you have smaller responses, there's more room to grow um, than you have um, when you have a large response. Um, so we don't see, we still see enhancement. Enhancement's still happening. Multisensory enhancement's still happening. The super additive effect of multisensory integration is still happening. Um, it's just not as big. It's not as robust when we already have this large response from one unimodal component. This, of course, also has a big fancy name. Um, it's the principle of inverse effectiveness. So again, that we're gonna have more effectiveness of this multisensory integration, of this multisensory enhancement, when we have a small um, response from these components. So we have a small response, we get a big enhancement. Um, and because it's inverse, we'll see less effectiveness, we'll see less enhancement, we'll see a small enhancement for really large responses. Um, so again, it's that inverse situation that they're kind of happening opposite. Um, and that's, again, still working within this system that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, but it's just not equally <laughs> greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so if its parts are really big, we'll still add together and we'll still get bigger, um, but it won't be as a big of, a, of an enhancement as we'll see when those parts are small. And again, that's that principle of inverse effectiveness. Um, so this kind of um, works on how the, the proposed way that the, and the th theoretical way that we think the systems work and this benefit from this multi-sensory integration. There's a theory that really looks at this um, as what is the benefit of this enhancement? Why is this enhancement good? So we see that there is this enhancement in the system. We see um, that this is happening, that this multi-sensory integration, we're getting better info when they're together than when they're up, apart. Um, we're getting this enhancement, but what's the benefit of that? And one of the theories that addresses that is the intersensory redundancy hypothesis. And again, science, big words. Um, but what it means is when you have information from intersensory, so more than one sensory, when those sensories are working together, um, when those sensory information is the same, that redundancy, when we're getting the same information um, from each of these, um, that we're going to get, that, that's going to be beneficial. So that enhancement that we're getting, um, this is going to be beneficial. Um, the intersensory redundancy hypothesis um, t is primarily focused um, on learning, and so it's primarily a developmental model. Um, they looked at this a lot in infants. They also looked at it a lot in quail. I don't know why they picked quail, but they did. Um, I think it's a cheap thing to have young, um, so Bob White quail. Um, and what they, the theory says is that when information, and this is amodal information, so this is information that is not specific to one modality, one sensory modality, is presented in two or more, that we're going to have this, and we know, you and I know, we're going to have this multisensory enhancement, right? Um, but when this information is presented, and they're in temporal synchrony, so that means these things are synced up, this is not you get the audio and then you get the visual. This is the audio and the visual are right there together in a natural state the way they're supposed to be. Um, but this really helps our attention. Um, we are going to pay more attention to information that's presented multi-sensory. Um, and because we pay more attention to this information that is multi-sensory, we're gonna learn from it better um, because we're getting this information in more than one way. Um, so, you know, think about it just your textbook. When you just read your textbook, it's not as helpful um, as then you do other things. Um, you talk to other people about it. Um, you maybe listen to these video lectures, these different things. When you're getting this information from more than one place, it's easier to learn from it. It's easier to hold your attention. It's easier to hold your attention um, to slides if I were physically in front of you than if I'm presenting it this way. Because when I'm physically in front of you, you both are getting the audio of my speech, but you're also getting the vision of me talking about these things. And you guys are missing out on a lot of gestures. I gesture like a crazy person. Um, that would make, that holds your attention. Why is Dr. Atchison gesticulating that way? Um, 
these kinds of things attract your attention. And when they attract your attention, um, it's an opportunity for better learning. And that's not in any way talking about my own teaching abilities. That's just an example to talk about how when you're paying better attention to something, you have an opportunity to better learn from it. So let's talk about kind of the examples of this. So what Barrick um, and her colleagues are saying is that when you're getting information unimodally, either audio, or visually, that that's not gonna be as useful. That's not gonna maintain your attention, especially for me, Looking at that hammer hitting the desk just by itself, I'm like, okay, what's going on? But when that information is presented in temporal synchrony, synced up, you're going to pay better attention to it. And this is especially true of, again, this is developmental theory, so this is especially true of young infants. So again, the idea, what Barrick and her colleagues are saying, is this information, we, there was information there. There was information about tempo, how, how quickly we were beating on that desk. Um, there was information about rhythm. These are kinds of things that are amodal information. Um, and we can learn better about them um, when it's presented bimodally or multimodally than we would if we're either being presented that audio or that visual. Again, this is gonna be because of that multi-sensory um, enhancement. Because of that, it's going to, um, according to the intersensory redundancy hypothesis, really facilitate so attention, selective attention, what we're choosing to pay attention to, and because of that is an opportunity to promote learning. So this is a line of research that has a bunch of different kind of facets. Again, um, this has been done with Bob White Quail. We won't go into that as much. We'll kind of focus on the more infants part of it because um, I like infancy research. Okay, so um, Barrick and her colleagues kind of started this research a very long time ago um, and found that three-month-olds, and this is three-month-olds, we're talking about very, very young babies, um, can match an object's motion to the appropriate soundtrack. Um, when, the, when that temporal synchrony is caught up. They're going to think that that sound is coming from that object when that synchrony is there. Um, they're not going to think that that sound is coming from that object when that synchrony is not there. They also were able to show that three and five month old infants could tell the difference between changes in rhythm when they're being presented bimodally, when they're getting information in two different modalities. They could tell when the rhythm changed. However, when they were getting this information in just one modality, so if I was, you know, ham that hammering on that desk and I sped up or I slowed down, it's going to be harder to detect that with just one modality than it is two modalities. And they found that that was true for three and five month old infants as well. Um, that again, they're going to be better able to do that. In terms of more complex stimuli, four and six month old infants can categorize infant directed speech, but only really when presented in, both of them can only do it when it's presented in audiovisual synchrony. There's some nuances for who can do what, when, and where, um, but the only situation that we've found that four and six month olds can both categorize this speech is when they're getting videos of this speech that are temporally synchronous. Um, so when they're getting the speech and the voice, the speech and the face synced up in a natural way, like if you were looking at someone talking. When the video is presented without synchrony, that video is still there and that speech is still there, but it's presented without synchrony, six month olds no longer categorize. We lose their attention. They're not paying attention to that information um, because it's not synced up. So again, this really shows us that not only is multisensory integration happening, that there's a benefit to that. We get this enhancement of information through this multisensory integration. And because of this enhancement through this multisensory integration, that this can really be an opportunity to really hold our attention better. And when we know, when we hold our attention better, we can perceive it better. And when we can perceive it better, we have an opportunity for learning.
So that ends the first lecture on multimodal um, sensory integration. Thanks.